All right, welcome everyone. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Maurice BP Weeks. I'm the co-executive director of the Action Center on Race and the Economy. It's so amazing to be on the phone uh, with so many of you this evening to talk about our campaign for a homes guarantee and what we can do together to win what we all deserve. So many of you joined us last week and we're really, really glad to have you back. Some of you are joining us for the first time tonight and welcome. If you're on your computer, you can put your name and your city in the chat box just so we can get a sense of who's on and where people are calling in from and then we can say hi. We know that this campaign is especially important right now. Uh, in our campaign, we train our base to use the question, what can we do today so that tomorrow we can do what we cannot do today? The politics of what's possible today are shifting around us. So today, even when so much is unsteady, it's critical that we commit ourselves to bold ideas, radical actions, and that we identify new ways to organize and win together. So today we're gonna to focus on the basics and something that I know is really, really important, Tenant Organizing 101. So before we get going, I wanna just uh, highlight some logistics of the call. Um, we have lots of folks on the line and uh, because of that, everyone's lines are muted right now. Um, if you're joining us on video, you'll be able to see uh, the face of the speakers, but we can't see your face. Um, if you have a question and you're joining us through the Zoom app on your computer or on your phone, you can type it into the question and answer box. You'll see the icon for that at the bottom of your screen. We're gonna try and respond to as many questions as we can during, uh, during the program, a little bit later in the program. Also, feel free to use that same chat box that you just dropped your name and location into to communicate with other participants um, and the panelists as we, as we start going. If you have any tech difficulties, we can hopefully help to troubleshoot them, uh, you can send an email to homes at peoplesaction.org. Um, and if you're not on Zoom and just dialed in through the phone, that's totally okay. More than happy that you're here uh, and we're excited to interact with you and talk together. So just so you know, we are recording this call to share with people who weren't able to join us tonight. Um, we don't intend for this to be a media call, uh, but everyone who speaks should assume that they're um, you know, uh, being listened to, this is public and recorded. And finally, uh, this call is scheduled to wrap up by the end of the hour. Um, however, a few of us who are experienced in tenant organizing are happy to stay on the call for about 30 minutes after that to answer any questions that you have that we might not get to. So with all of that, I'm gonna step out of the way and it's my pleasure to introduce Noah Barr, who's a grassroots leader with Push Buffalo. Take it away, Noah. Thank you. Hi, my name is Noah. I am an organizer with Push Buffalo and I brought some observations over the past couple of weeks that I wanted to share. My name is Noah, I'm 21 years old, African-American and was born and raised in Buffalo, New York. I live with my partner who is also 21 years old and was raised in Puerto Rico. I'm an organizer working at Push Buffalo, making $15 an hour, calling people to let them know that the presidential election got pushed back till June 23rd, as well as to not give up hope. We live in a studio shoebox apartment, no bigger than 320 square feet, living from check to check. We were never able to fully afford groceries in the first place. My partner's family had helped us by sharing food stamps and now there's not enough to supply for both houses. We had the decision to make whether or not we will give up the money that we've earned before the pandemic publicly reached my city. Seeing my corner stores and non-perishables dwindle while toilet paper and medicine aisles were ramshacked. The action shows not only the priority of resources that people fall to claim, but the potential disaster that the public will have if the circumstances of COVID-19 worsen. I'm afraid of the air and food stores. The buses have turned to death floats parading through the streets, allowing people on the outside to watch who are most at risk. The money that I have now has to last, and the fear of being pushed to the street for not giving over what can help me and my partner's life in this situation and pandemic is showing. There are mothers who are slowly not having food to give, 6.6 .6 million people filing for unemployment, having to wait at least a month if they do get a check, while in the meantime, there are past, bill dues, past due bills still coming. The narrative is that we need to stay home when people are at risk of losing theirs. Even through social distancing, we can fight together. We need to share all of our stories to show the effects of the problems that our government failed to act on. It's been historical and we need to show that we can be able to develop the power not only to create the properties that we have for each other, but to have a system that will last. 
economically and otherwise. Thank you. Noah, thank you for your leadership and for your work. Your story is so important and it's about transforming private pain into public power. And that's actually core to what we're talking about today. So before we know exactly where we're going, we need to know where we are. My name is Tara Raghavir and I'm an organizer with the Campaign for National Homes Guarantee and also with a group of fierce tenants in Kansas City, Missouri called KC Tenants. And I wanna talk a little bit about what's happening right now in this moment. First, the public health crisis is getting worse and it's gonna be a while. This morning, polling revealed that one out of six people in the country knows someone with coronavirus and expectations are that the virus will spread over the coming months, even as people stay home if they're able to. Because of the slow and incoherent response to the pandemic from the Trump administration, the United States will likely experience thousands more deaths due to the virus in the days to come. We're in this for a while and we have to figure out what to do with that. Second, the response to the economic crisis from Congress was not nearly strong enough. As we discussed on last week's call, the bill that was recently passed does, does very little actually to help people like us, but a lot to support big corporations and the financial sector. In the next round of legislation, which we expect in a month or so, we're gonna fight like hell with our partners around the country to win policies that put our people over profits. Third, workers and tenants are fighting back. Just this week, we saw workers at Amazon, Whole Foods, Instacart, and the clothing retailer Everlane claiming power together by going on strike or walking off the job over protest about the lack of protection they receive at work from this virus. At a time when people's lives depend on frontline essential workers, from people working at grocery stores and corner markets, to people in Amazon warehouses, to delivery drivers and grocery store shoppers, the lives of these workers depend on having bigger claims to public power, and we stand with them. We stand with the tenants who are showing radical solidarity to their neighbors and with the tenants who are organizing for better as well. And finally, to ground us in this moment, today is April 2nd, and the rent was due yesterday. A lot of us didn't pay. A lot of us couldn't pay. And even if we scraped together the money to pay yesterday, it came at a cost. I know people who didn't buy groceries for the week so that instead they could pay their landlord. I know others who are donating plasma or taking out title loans on their cars. We all know many people who might have paid this month but won't be able to pay their rent on May 1st or might choose not to. And we're here together tonight to say with one voice that it's not our fault that we can't pay the rent. It's the result instead of a broken system that's more interested in profits for some than in homes for all. The brokenness has been clarified in this moment of crisis and we know that we have to build the power to win immediate relief and to change the whole system. There's just no other option. So now I'm gonna pass it back to my friend Maurice to help us imagine the road ahead. Thanks Tara. So this crisis period isn't gonna end anytime soon, unfortunately. Um, even after the pandemic passes, our communities will be hurting from this really for years to come. Last week, 10 million people filed for unemployment. The week before that, 3 million people filed for unemployment. Even if folks paid rent yesterday, millions won't be able to pay next month. As Tara said, we're not here just for immediate relief. We're here to win a homes guarantee. Short-term eviction moratoriums are good, but they're not good enough. Even if, we, if, even if we want a total rent suspension for the crisis period, which would be amazing, it wouldn't solve systemic problems in how we think about housing in America. We need a homes guarantee that puts people before profits and ensures that everyone has a safe, accessible, sustainable, permanently affordable home. If we had a homes guarantee, and if housing was a public good instead of a commodity, Dealing with this crisis would be a lot different. A homes guarantee would literally save lives. So when we think about what it means to win in this context, we have to be planning for the future. So everyone on this call, I want you to do an exercise with me. Um, we're gonna do a little bit of imagination. So you can close your eyes if you feel comfortable and take a second to imagine. Imagine 
what would it take to guarantee everyone safe, accessible, sustainable, permanently affordable homes? What would need to change? And think really big, think about the federal government, think about the folks on Wall Street, and now think really small. Think about things in your building, on your street, in your town. Okay, so you can open your eyes. So I'm sure there were some really amazing things that popped up there. I'm hoping that folks can type the answers of what, uh, what it would take to actually win that into the chat box so that everyone can see. I think if we share some of those visions of what it would take, um, it'll empower all of us to fight for it even harder. Um, so feel free to type that in the chat box. What will it take for us to win all of those amazing things that we talked about? What will it take for us to win a homes guarantee? I'm seeing decommodification of housing, less millionaires and billionaires, solidarity, living wages. These are some really, really great things. Um, and they all are under one real theme, which is we need to fundamentally overhaul the entire system. I think everyone who's in the chat right now uh, agrees that the market has failed our people. Racial capitalism has oppressed our people. So we need to build enough power to change everything. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my friend John Washington, who will tell us how we get to the world we imagined together. John? Thank you so much. Um, we're in an unprecedented moment. Um, our country is in pain. The world is in pain. And we need to work to turn that private pain into public power. I know I got phone calls from so many people over the last few days who are thinking about what to do about the rent, what to do about their future. When is the next stimulus coming? How do I file for unemployment? And if we want to be able to build a mass movement that is capable of meeting the demands that we're putting out there of rent zero, cancel rent, uh, if we're going to be able to build a mass movement that can actually make rent strikes effective, then we have to get back to basics. And as organizers and leaders, uh, we know that we can often get out of practice and a rent strike or any kind of powerful collective public action has to start with building trust and deep relationships. There are a lot of ambitious activists out here that are responding to the opportunity presented by the collective self-interest that has been built in this COVID-19 crisis. But we need to respond to people as human beings, their thoughts, their fears, their needs. We need to build relationships that also uncover their hopes and their dreams and their vision for the future of their buildings, their families, and their neighborhoods. Everyone is afraid, and while we need to think strategically about how we use our power, there is no strategy without people power, and there is no power without relationships. In communities, neighborhoods, and buildings, there are leaders who are struggling with this moment, and our power lies in our ability to be vulnerable and inspire vulnerability as a community in the face of crisis. Our people need to know that it's not their fault that they can't pay rent. They need to know that their neighbors are with them in the same struggle. And they need to feel that solidarity in the face of forms of oppression that have silenced their pain, sometimes for generations. And most of all, they need to feel like their fellow tenants and neighbors truly care about them and our collective future. We're not a charity. We're not psychologists but we do have the power to share our stories and help people get clear on theirs. As the panelists on this call and the tenant leaders around the country will tell you, it starts small and it grows at the speed of trust. And when tenants do build deep and powerful relationships, they're able to build the kind of infrastructure that we need to achieve a homes guarantee. I imagine a future where the millions of people who couldn't pay rent through this crisis are building powerful groups in their buildings, in their communities, that can ultimately coalesce into powerful tenant unions that can actually be the building blocks of a movement to decommodify housing piece by piece and piece of legislation by piece of legislation. Rent strikes and home guarantees are big ideas that can drive us, but they can only drive us at the speed of trust. So what is a tenant union? Uh, a tenant union is simply 
people with a shared identity and a shared set of hopes and desires working together to exercise the power they have to demand their rights and ultimately to demand self-determination. And that is why collective and relational power is so important. Because again, while folks out there may want to call for a national rent strike, we all know that folks are not gonna take that type of risk unless they're in deep relationship and deep trust with the folks around them. And once that's established, um, the potential is immense. Um, so now I wanna take two or three questions from the chat. Um, yeah. So John, we've got a question here from Andrea and we'll definitely dig into this more in just a little bit, Andrea, but she asks, how do we talk to our neighbors about not paying the rent? My neighbors are too afraid of our landlord. What do you say to that, John? So first, I think that a lot of people are, are kind of skipping a step. It really depends on your relationship to those neighbors. Uh, so right now, I think what we're all trying to do is use these as a place to build a connection. Uh, because we cannot work through that fear unless we fundamentally understand where that fear comes from, what people's personal histories look like, uh, where they've been, and where they want to go. So I would say now is a time to talk to people about why are they afraid of their landlord? Why are they, where did that fear come from? What are some of the lived experiences that they've been through with this landlord that then after we've done some one-on-one -on -one work, we can then say, these are demands that we want to make beyond just a rent suspension or just relief in this immediate moment. Uh, but we actually have demands about our conditions, about how we're treated and about the, the cost uh, that housing, of housing that, that this individual landlord is putting on us. So I'll say when people are talking to you about the rent, I would respond by asking questions about their lives, about what's going on, about what they're, what, what they're suffering through. And really, to be honest, this is a moment where we're all grieving. We've all lost either individuals or ideas or just the way of life that we're used to. Um, so I think being compassionate through those moments will allow us to build the kind of relationship where you can then strategize around how to move that person toward a rent strike. And John, we've got a couple of questions about this and I know you're gonna dig in even further in a bit, but Eli asks, how can organizers help tenants and neighbors build their relationships in this time of social distancing? i.e. how do we get into deep relationships ourselves when we can't go door knocking? Uh, so really the beauty of, of, of our communities is they're already existing relationships. Every building in every neighborhood has characters, people who know, that person who just says hi to everyone. So for me, if you already know people, then it's who do those people know? And how do you deepen the relationships that you already have and understand the networks of relationships that the folks who you're talking to have and start to work with them to uncover their self-interest so that you know how to work through that fear and then try to get them to do the same thing. So this is all really about building connections, tapping into natural leadership, and then doing the type of leadership development that will put that person on an arc to where they are willing to take public and collective action. John, we've got another question here. We've got a lot of questions about how to build trust and build relationship. We'll get back to those in John's next piece. But we've got a cool question here from Scott in the Q&A section. Are there international models of social housing, homes guarantees that we can look to as successes and work towards here? The reason I wanna pull out that question is like part of the vision or the vision is part of how we build trust and build relationship with folks. So do you wanna to speak to that, John? Uh, yes, so across Europe, there are great models for social housing, um, and there are some that are even evolving, and, and there really is a movement to decommodify housing. Um, so I think there's lots of examples um, in Germany and, and definitely in the social democracies, and we have some folks on our policy team who've written a lot about that, um, looking at uh, Daniel Adana Cohen about what is possible. Um, and then I think the UK definitely has a really powerful tenant organizing movement um, that I definitely look to for information um, on how to, about how to go about building this kind of solidarity. Um, and so I think we can all definitely put some of that information in the resources we send out after the call. I'm gonna take one more question from the chat. Hannah says, I think the main concern in our building is that this feels like a crisis moment when we need to take action now. So we wanna do relationship building at the same time as taking quick action, which brings me back to that beautiful quote that you said, start small and build at the speed of trust. How do you think um, you can advise people around the speed in which we feel like we need to act right now versus the speed in which we need to build deep relationships? 
So yeah, I think the real question is what is the action that, that everyone feels? And so part of the relationship building is actually tapping into everyone is feeling this tension. How are people feeling it? How are they processing it? And what are they willing to do? So while you want, may want to react quickly as an individual, it's incredibly important to start to bring people with you. And that can be a really great icebreaker for your conversations to say, okay, everybody wants to take some action. Let me check in with the folks who want to take action on what they want to do, how they think about doing it, so that we can say to those folks, yes, we do need to take action, but that action has to be collective. And if it's not collective, then it's not going to have the power to win. And so we can move real fast uh, with a few people, or we can take a little bit more time uh, to be effective at building power. Thanks, John. So Todd in the chat says, this is great. Would love to see and study some examples. Um, and that's great timing, Todd, because next up, we've got a case study um, but before we hand it off, I want to give it back to John. John, can you just tell us a little bit more about you and your experience doing tenant organizing before you hand it over to Ryan and Barbara? Uh, sure. So now I'm on the Homes Guarantee team, but I was the director of organizing for Push Buffalo and a community organizer. Um, I did organizing around building community land trusts and communities and have been working to build a tenant union and tenant bill of rights in the city of Buffalo. Uh, also done extensive work in the creation of over 100 units of affordable housing and statewide campaigns, which uh, last year uh, was able to redefine uh, housing's relationship to the economy in New York State. And we're continuing with our New York State Homes Guarantee campaign. Awesome. John, do you want to introduce us to Ryan and Barbara? Yes. And so um, Ryan and Barbara are from the Rochester Tenant Union uh, and the City Roots Community Land Trust. And I met Ryan a few years ago when he asked for some support in figuring out how to build a land trust. I asked, well, how, how, how are you going to get the, the, uh, the land for the, to go into trust? And he said, well, we're going to get it from slumlords. And at that moment, you know, in my head, I laughed a little bit. And over the years, um, watching what they've been able to do, which I don't want to give any spoilers, has been truly amazing. And I think there's a lot of folks that are organizing around conditions, lowering rent and things. But the vision for social housing that is held by this group is, is just fundamentally amazing. Uh, so I'll kick it over to Ryan and Barbara to tell you a little bit more about what they've been able to accomplish and some of the how they've been able to do that that is so important for this moment. Ryan? Awesome. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, so I'm Ryan from the CY10 in Rochester, in Rochester, upstate New York. And just wanted to share some experiences from Rochester. You know, we organized and supported a number of rent strikes in Rochester um, and had some success with them. Success in changing people's conditions in their buildings, successful in empowering folks, successful in um, changing and highlighting local policies and supporting the change of state policies, and also changing um, the idea that we can not just be um, tenants that have to take orders from landlords, but we can organize to have agreements, uh, cooperative agreements, cooperative ownership, and decommodified housing. So um, to give a little bit of example of, of one rent strike, um, I'll tell you a little about from uh, from the outside, and Barbara's going to tell you about from the inside. But in 2000, early 2018, um, there was, we had got some news about there was um, a building that didn't have heat in it, and we organized some tenants in that building and started to follow back to start doing outreach to all the buildings that this slumlord owned, and this time 17 buildings in Rochester. And in one building on Thurston Road, um, at this time, we we knocked on all the doors, and there were and found um, people that really wanted to engage and come together. And through this process, we ended up having regular meetings in the building where people could express what was going on for them. And in this case, people were suffering with no locks on their doors, sewage backup. You know, every time some some apartments, people would um, try to run water in their sink, and sewage would back up. Um, in the bathtub, or ceilings were collapsing, um, and, and water was pouring in for, for one apartment for 30 straight days. Um, just horrific, horrific conditions. In this case, um, a slumlord from downstate in Staten Island that was just running these buildings um, down. And through the process of, of having regular meetings where people would 
um, connect with each other and talk about what their conditions were, um, people began to build trust with each other. And especially it was important to build trust around the key leaders in the building. There were about three people that lived there for 18, 19, some people 20 years and were social and knew what was going on. And through that process, what we found is that um, some people started to admit, like, yeah, actually, I, I didn't pay my rent last month. And then, and another person said, actually, you know, I didn't pay rent for two months. And through this process where trust was actually built, because initially everybody said they were paying, right? But when, when, the, when the trust was built and people were really opening up about what was happening, what we found is that a lot of people were already engaging in private acts of resistance. And they were already finding ways to resist in their own way to what they knew what was fundamentally wrong and how they were being mistreated. And when we organize in, in our, our citywide tenant union, we never go around telling people what to do, right? We don't go around telling people, you need to do this. You need to do this protest. You need to do that. You know, you need to, you know, go on a rent strike. We never tell anybody like that, anything, anything like that. But what we do do is harness and support the energy that's already there, right? In this building, there were people that already had this natural leadership, already had people that were in there. And what we did is we said, well, what if these individual acts of resistance were coordinated, were unified, were clarified with a goal? Um, and so what we did is continue to have those meetings and educate the people say, it's important we know our rights. And it's important that we know our power. Right, because our legal rights are important, but really what's going to bring about any major changes is knowing your collective rights and your collective power, which a landlord, which can overpower any landlord or any court. Right. So through this process of meeting people where they're at, uh, we began to gave in that sort of deep process and that is also education and to say, well, um, <clears throat> what is the goal here? Is the goal just to get repairs? Or is the goal um to actually, what if what if you could own the building? Or is the goal to get the build, landlord to sell the building to another investor? Or is the goal to get the building to be sold to, to the tenants? Right, so through this process, uh, which we've engaged in a number of buildings, um, begin the process to say, what, how can we use a rent strike to empower the residents, to, to educate, and to actually make dramatic changes not only in the building, but to politicize the issues that are going on in the community and the injustices and certain larger policy demands, but also what is the actual just housing system we want to live in. I want to turn it over to Barbara to share a little bit about um, some of the things that happened um, within the building and talk about some of the successes and how we. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Barbara Rivera. I joined the uh, tenant union um i think a little bit after they started the run strike um the ceiling at the time had fallen on my daughter in the bathroom because of you know pretty much the building has gone years and years and years of like no proper ma uh, maintenance so over time it just kind of fell apart so um i was giving my then back then she was six months old um my daughter a bath and she uh the ceiling had fell um we called maintenance i uh went to all my neighbors because it was like something that had happened and i was just like oh my god i don't know what to do um i you know i relied on my neighbors we all like pretty much harassed the maintenance guy he didn't care he like hung up on us put his phone on silent and uh let it go to voicemail um i called the next day they sent a, uh, uh, um, what's her name? Uh, Laura Pound. She was like the, uh, um, pretty much the, the, the lady that comes and inspects the, the building. You know what I mean? She was like doing some type of job. I didn't call her an inspector because I didn't think that's exactly what she was doing. So she came and she was like, all right, I'm just going to have someone come in and uh, we're going to put something over it and it'll be fine. And I was just like, okay, so in my mind, I'm thinking like, they're gonna fix it. They didn't really do that. They just put a piece of plaster on top and they called it fixed. And they didn't really fix the pipe or fix the, the black mold or the, the old rusty uh, pipe system that they had in there. It wasn't really like something that was on their mind to fix, so they didn't care. 
Uh, but not too lo long after that, uh, Mary Brown, she's the uh, president of the tennis association over here at Thurston. And she was like, you know, I heard about what happened to your daughter. Um, we're starting a rent strike. Do you want to join us? Like, she's like, you know, you can fight this. Like, this isn't fair. You shouldn't have to deal with this. Um, because during that time, I also got an eviction notice. And um, I was like, you know, just taken back because I was just like, well, the ceiling fell on my daughter and I'm getting an eviction notice. Like, how fair is this, right? Like, um, so just, I didn't know what to do. So I went to the meeting and that's where I met Ryan and, and Liz. And um, that's when I started like just finding out about my just tenant rights, things that I didn't know from the very beginning. Um, things that I was just like, oh, I can speak up about that and I won't have to worry about retaliation from a landlord. Like, okay, this is, this is kind of different. This is cool. Um, and not to mention like citywide, just kind of like they had our backs on any decision that we wanted to make. Like Ryan said, it didn't like force us to do anything. They were like, so this is what you can do um what are your ideas like what do you want to do like how do you feel about that like you know so we were like well we want to speak up we want to fight back we won't we don't want to pay rent if this is how we're living no one wants to live in um mold and and live with roaches and rats and falling you know ceilings and just your whole household is just like a whole mess like you can't even drink water out of your faucet or take a bath because you have sewage coming out like that's ridiculous um so we went on a almost a year long rent strike. Um, it was exhausting. Um, it was hard, but the tenants, we held on and we like stuck together. This is like that, that was like our opportunity to like build that trust within each other, just as neighbors and just as people. Like we have people that normally wouldn't even mix with each other meeting and every weekend once a week or going to knock on each other's doors and saying like hey are you okay uh do you need food or you know what i mean just like certain things like that like we stuck together and that was like very powerful um even like uh, like just just when the landlord tried to come in and give us false eviction notices we were like, no, we're not dealing with this. Like, we're going to wait for a real judge to send us an eviction notice and we'll handle it that way. Um, and just for that, like, I'm grateful because it showed, like, how much people power and how, like, amazing that can be and how intimidating that can be to a landlord or an investor in general because they don't expect you to talk. They don't expect you to know your rights. They don't expect you to, like, say, hey, I'm not dealing with this anymore, and I don't want to anymore. Um, so we, we held on um, for an entire year. They did renovations. They moved us all out of our uh, apartments that we were living in, and they put us in uh, temporary houses with the contracts with other landlords for that year until they renovated the building. Um, and we had to stay on things that we wanted done in the building. We said we wanted on-site laundry. We wanted new bathrooms. We didn't want like replacements. We wanted everything strictly brand new, straight out the box. Like um, we kept in contact with the developer. Um, home leasing was very like open to everything that they were doing. They sent us newsletters. Um, they let us come see the building when it was almost done. Like, you know what I mean? They let us like in to what they were doing. Um, so they, we got funds from the state, which was really awesome because that helped with getting the, the development done. The process was, was really smooth. Um, and they moved us back in about two months ago. Um, and it, it's going pretty good. So right now we, uh, we're okay. We, the citywide tenant union also, uh, shut down another developer. Um, his name is Ron Zor. Um, he owned three other properties that were just like falling apart. I think they were probably just as bad as Thurston. Um, probably even worse in my opinion, because like as soon as I walked into the property, I was just like, people cannot live like this. Like this is just ridiculous, like beyond me. Um, 
So we, were, we managed to shut it down on New Year's Day. Like, we did not hesitate. As soon as we the ball dropped, the next day we were on it. Um, we managed to get one property that are working with home leasing right now. Um, and they're working on getting the tenants to own the property. So I'm excited about that because that's a new step. Um, I'm, I was 30 second warning. Got it. Um, but it just that just our story right there just shows that it can happen if we wanted to do this rent strike, like for real. Um, and I think if all the neighbors get together and they like talk to each other, build that bond and that structure with each other and that trust, which is most important, I think it's totally like possible. And I, I'm very hopeful to support my my tenants here in Rochester. I'm very excited to, to just support them and help them lead them, you know, in any way and help build, build leadership in our in our community. So. Thanks so much, Barbara and Ryan. Amazing work. Love to hear a victory story. John, before we take questions, because it looks like everyone has pretty general questions about organizing, mm -hmm. um, wanted to hand it back to you to summarize some of the lessons and then take us right into the basics. How do we actually replicate what Ryan and Barbara did? So I think, you know, what, what Barbara just talked about of how this went from one building to the next building to the next building and how they were able to continue the arc from conditions to collective ownership to getting state resources so that these folks actually have a stake and have self-determination. I just want folks to pause and, and take a moment to think about how different this moment would be if the majority of Americans lived in social housing that they owned and controlled. We would not be worrying about paying our landlords, we would be worrying about paying ourselves. And so to me, this is an example of how organizing grows exponentially out of a core of really deep trust and how we can even extend the vision of tenant organizing uh, beyond just the building, but to taking over a community. Uh, so that story is so inspiring and I think it really highlights all of the things we wanna bring up in this call. And so shifting now to doing just the basic step-by-steps of, of how we start this process. Um, and so some of the ways that we have to do this during COVID is to shift from thinking about these big ideas of rent strikes and home guarantees and really get deep and relational about the why. Why do we want a homes guarantee? Why do we want a rent strike? Why are people afraid of their landlords? And to me, that starts with relationship mapping. Who do you know in your building? Who do you know in your community? Who do you know that is a renter? Uh, in a community, in a building, who do you see a lot? Who's the person that's like always by the elevator? Um, who are the people that other people go to? Who has a nickname? Like in my experience of organizing, there's always like a couple people, oh, you know, you know, Crazy Joe. Um, so what are the actual ways that people are building solidarity, working together to survive? Because especially with poor people, especially marginalized people, we all build systems and relationships that help us work through uh, what we're all going through. And what can we learn about these networks? What can we learn about the individuals who are in leadership? Uh, because to me, it's, it's really all about identifying the natural, the, the natural leader. Um, once we've done some relationship mapping, seeing like, can we get some of those folks to actually help us spread the word? And so to me, it really also, all of these strategies depend on the existing relationships you have. So if you don't have relationships, then I think you go straight to building relationships of trying to do one-on-ones. And I don't think we always need to think of one-on-ones um, traditionally, just, just giving someone a phone call and saying, hey, how you doing? Uh, what's going on? How have you been in this crisis? I know I don't talk to you a lot. I know I only see you at the elevator, but um, you know, do you need anything? What, what's been happening? How's your family? And starting a conversation about what people are going through, what they're feeling and what they're thinking about. And I think, you know, I think saying also a little bit of vulnerability about what you're thinking about, what you're going through um, and, and how um, tenants can move together. Um, after that, using that relationship mapping to do some list, list building. Um, so if you've identified folks, who are the folks that know those folks and how can those folks help you continue to add to your list and how can you use your relationship with the folks who do know other people um, to start to move toward 
building a base. Uh, but it really has to start with the trust and the relationships that exist. And then how do those relationships extend? And how are we strengthening each individual relationship to actually build a network of strong relationships? Um, so I'm going to pause right there to take a couple questions. Okay, John, we've got some really good ones. Um, anonymous attendee asks, we have already organized our building and sent a letter to the landlord slash building management, but some people are worried to pay, um, are, are able to pay and scared for their own renting futures. And I'm worried they will abandon the movement. How do we keep people engaged and committed knowing we won't get our demands met right away or possibly ever? So what I'm hearing right now is that that those folks need to to be reached out to and, and talk to. And, and again, not about I'm trying to convince you to withhold your rent and take this risk, but really about where they're at as human beings and how they see their privilege. And also, I think a meeting and honestly, Zoom calls are, are exhausting, but they're what we got right now where those tenants can really hear what other tenants are going through and what is the power and the meaning of their solidarity. Um, so I think it's really important that the tenants who do have some privilege and are struggling with this, this, this risk are in deep relationship with the tenants who are going through the worst issues and so that they can really feel and understand, hey, I may have the privilege to, to be able to pay my rent, but you know what? The woman downstairs from me is a single mother who was transitioning jobs and the second job didn't come through and, and now her kids are starving. And so to me, it's again, you as the initiator of this network of relationships, but it's also who else needs to be in relationship so that people can see their self-interest in this collective action. Great. Um, Barbara or Ryan or anyone else, do you have anything to add to that? The question of how do we how do we work with folks who are maybe in a position of privilege and they're scared to take collective action, or people just in general who are scared of retaliation? Ryan, we can't hear you. I don't think your phone's connected anymore. Barbara, did you want to jump in? Um. I know it's it's gonna be scary, obviously. Um, but right now, landlords can evict you, um, and within ninety days, I don't think that they're gonna be able to evict people either. So that's like the the goal. And and I know people aren't comfortable right now to talk to each other, but it's like most important to build that um, that that community bond, that that structure. Um, I don't know. I just, I feel it's going to be scary. We just have to break out of that box. Like with us over at Thurston, it was, I was uncomfortable knocking on my neighbor's doors and asking them like, Hey, what's going on in your house? Like, you know, but we have to do it. We have to push that. We have leaders already in place in our certain communities that are ready to say, Hey, this is what, you know, you can do. Like, let's work together and let's, let's get this done. You know what I mean? So, I'll take um, one more question for this section and then we'll do another Q&A after. Um, sorry, there's a little bit of an echo. Thanks, Barbara. Um, I'll take another question now and then John's gonna go through the rest of the steps and we'll take a couple more in a second. So a lot of people are really interested, John, in hearing you say a little bit more about how folks can build deep relationships with their neighbors during a time of quarantine and social distancing and when their neighbors might actually be scared to meet together or talk even at the doors. Yeah, so I also think that people, especially people who've been in organizing, really need to think about who brought you into this movement, who brought you into this work, and how did they do that? And what is actually your lived experience at being radicalized or at someone doing this process with you? And how has it been effective with other leaders you work with? Because I really do believe that, that folks genuinely know um, I think right now it's really about who you know, what access to technology they have, and just having the, the courage to reach out and ask some questions. Because when people are afraid, they want to talk to people that they trust. Like when I'm afraid, I might not talk to like a random person. But when I'm afraid, 
I'm going to call my best friend. I'm going to call Christian. I'm going to call DQ. I'm going to call the people that I am in relationship with. And right now there are a lot of people who feel very alone and afraid. And while it may not seem like it in the first few moments of the conversation, um, I think a lot of folks are really searching to someone to talk to and process things with. Um, so I think again, not focusing directly number one problem is let's go get this landlord let's get the rent it's how did this affect you like what is happening do you have a plan for what's going on do you have you thought about this do you have kids but starting to ask some of these questions that really get at people's lives and then trying to go a little bit deeper about you know how we got to this place and what they were thinking three months ago um, before this COVID crisis, you know, became such a problem. And it really makes a lot of sense to really tap into, like, why are they afraid? And what are people going to lose? For, 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 for people who've been dealing with oppression their entire lives, we're used to kind of putting our stuff on the line uh, in moments of crisis. Um, but for people who are privileged, this might be the first time that they've ever really had to put themselves out there. So I really go back to what are the ways that you can really hold the tension of vulnerability. Um, and sometimes that's difficult for us because we may not want to be vulnerable ourselves. And we know um, that a lot of folks are not comfortable asking people to be vulnerable unless they're able to be vulnerable. Um, so just, I think, yeah. if I could just jump in real quick, like to get really practical about like quarantine tactics, a lot of different tenant unions and organizations are um, distributing sample letters and we'll actually uh, put out a glossary of materials afterwards. Um, so you can like go around and put letters under your neighbor's doors or tape them on their doors. I talked to someone in Kansas City last night who was like running around his apartment building with a marker and just writing his number on every available poster and surface so that his neighbors could call him and then also writing the number for like a tenant hotline because he knows a lot of his neighbors are really vulnerable so it, it can begin in these moments as like acts of mutual aid that then result in tenant organizing yes. um, John looking at the chat real quick or looking at the time rather um, do you want to take us back into the list of the basic steps and then we'll open back up for questions sure so I've, I've talked a lot about one-on-ones and relationship building um, but that's definitely the next step is to, is to continue the one-on-ones. And what I'll say about this is it's not just about you doing one-on-ones. It's about that first couple people that you meet and trying to get other people also to get into this process of leadership development where one person cannot canvas the whole building. One person cannot hold all the relationships in a building. Um, so you doing one-on-ones, but also you fig figuring out how to encourage others to do those one-on-ones. Um, then holding a tenant meeting. Um, and this can be via Zoom or WhatsApp. There's different technologies out there that are able to do that. There definitely are some difficulties in this moment of having a tenant meeting, but it is still possible. And the purpose of this meeting is really to get clarity about the collective self-interest and how everyone is seeing and feeling the suppression in similar ways. And if you're in a building that has lots of different folks of different incomes, it may be about um, getting some of the more privileged folks to hear the stories and the pain that some of the, their neighbors are going through, um, and then making sure that you're identifying your target and you're committing um, to continue these tactics, to continue to build power and getting clear on how everyone's feeling. Uh, with these demands, rent is obviously a huge concern, but if folks are afraid of their landlord, uh, some of that comes from this moment and some of that probably comes from conditions, from treatment, um, this might be, these are times to actually ask for better conditions, uh, free washing, maintenance that hasn't happened, uh, whatever there are collective issues. And it's really important that this be about, this is a moment where people have a different consciousness, but the issues are not about COVID. They're about the building, they're about the relationships, they're about what's already there. And we're just using this moment to kind of uplift those and move people toward them. Um, and then with tactics, collective is key. So. Um, instead of some people refusing, some people not being able to pay, um, putting that letter out to the landlord that says, hey, if you're not going to deal with us on these issues, we, ha we do have folks of privilege who are willing to not pay in solidarity, uh, social media, signs and windows, um, getting local press. Um, and so there's also, yeah, like, like Tara said, um, you know, giving out leaflets, writing your number in places, getting creative about being visible. Um, and then continuing to basically like lather, rinse, repeat, 
building on these tactics so that you can continue um, to build more um, with, with the tenants that you're bringing in that you may not know, and then continuing to hold those meetings so that all of this work actually does come together in a space where everyone can see what you've been building. Um, so we've gone through that pretty thoroughly and definitely will be following up with more materials on how to do this. And now we wanna hear from Linda Armitage, who is a fierce leader with deep experience doing this very kind of tenant organizing in Chicago. Linda? Thank you, John. Uh, again, my name is Linda Armitage. I'm a leader with Jane Adams Senior Caucus in Chicago. I lost everything 10 years ago in the financial crisis. Um, uh, my 401k dissolved. I had nothing. You will all remember that uh, the uh, predatory lenders, etc., who um, caused that crisis were bailed out because they were too big to fail. However, I was not bailed out and I had to rearrange my whole life. Cancel travel plans, cancel some education plans to find a place that I could afford to live in. I moved into a building owned by a nonprofit, but six months later, it was on the market for the highest bidder. My neighbors and I, 120 senior citizens, ages 65 to 92, were traumatized. We were gonna be homeless. They wanted us out of there. I had visions of ending up on the street with my cat, but we organized, we didn't let it happen. We did save our homes, it was not easy. Uh, we were eventually sold to the Chicago Housing Authority. We now live in public housing. Uh, the organizing that I did built our power for many fights to come and we're, we're continuing that constantly. So I wanna answer a few questions that have come up. Um, number one, how will organizing our neighbors help tenants in the building in the long run? I have found that tenants will eventually trust themselves and each other to stand together for their self-interest and their common values. They will be interested, I'm sorry, they will be listened to as a group. As you all know, individuals really don't carry a whole lot of weight with landlords, et cetera, or management companies. But if you're a group, at least they have to listen. They don't always act, but they do listen. And maybe achieve some partial goals to build on. We gain confidence in our roles as speakers and leaders. And we certainly had to build relationships with neighborhood and community leaders and other groups. We, we built some good coalitions. Uh, we also had to build relationships with local elected officials. We're, I always feel that we're so too, too dependent on elected officials, but they're part of life and we have to do that. And then uh, we realize that the group can be of value in future campaigns with neighborhood and community leaders and other groups. Second question is how can tenant power at the building level be le leveraged for more power? We have to keep being active and visible at all possible opportunities and add new people to the tenant union as soon as they move into the, into the building or as soon as possible after they move in and emphasizing their self-interest. And keep adding campaigns to the agenda of the group within the time and other resources. And keep nurturing those relationships within the group, with other groups and with electeds and work to elect your your champions. And finally, how does this get us to a homes guarantee? The homes guarantee is the big idea. We have to build a mass movement of tenants across the country in order to win. It's going to take a lot of people making decisions like the one I made to organize my neighbors and take on our landlord. We're, we're seniors. 
we, you know, gave up organizing and demonstrating back in the 60s and 70s. And here we were, you know, um, having to do this. So that built our power for building level victories and then city level victories and state. So when that power can be multiplied across city and state, we can get together with one another, demand more. And this is part of the infrastructure um, that's going to take to, to get the homes guarantee on a national level. If it can be imagined, it can be won. I often say this to people. You, you can imagine it. We couldn't have presented the Homes Guarantee documents if we couldn't imagine it. But we have to commit to taking radical actions. And sometimes it starts small, putting the flyer or putting a number on your neighbor's door, as Tara just explained. Small things like that can start a big movement. Thanks so much, Linda. Um, we had a couple more questions in the chat, but we're running right up on the hour. So I just want to remind folks that a few of us who are experienced tenant organizers will be sticking around for like 30 minutes after the call ends. And you can get all of your questions answered during that time. And now I'm going to hand it over to Divya to bring us home. Hi, I just want to put in really quickly, Linda's one of my organizing inspirations. That was cool to hear. Um, my name is Divya Sundaram, and I organize with Community Voices Heard a black and brown led organization fighting for housing justice in New York State. So we all feel kind of drained in this moment, but it's work like this and it's spaces like this that keep me grounded and keep me moving. I feel super hyped by what I've heard tonight and by the energy in this chat. Um, you all sound like you're ready to start organizing or that you've already started and that's super incredible and so needed. Um, but there are other emotions fueling us in this moment beyond just that excitement, right? Like Noah in Buffalo and Linda in Chicago and like comrades across the country. I'm angry. I'm pissed off. Our people are suffering in horrible conditions in public housing. Landlords are harassing our neighbors for rent payments we simply don't have. And industries are being bailed out to the tune of hundreds of billions while we all know people who are making choices between medicine and rent. So I need you all on this call to take action like us so we can win rent and mortgage, bleh, win rent and mortgage suspensions today and so we can win a homes guarantee tomorrow. So there are three things that you can do right after this call. So first, number one, start organizing. If you haven't already, make a list of everyone you know in your building. Start relationship mapping, make a flyer to take around to your neighbors and invite people to a virtual tenant meeting within the next week. Start building deeper relationships with your neighbors and create a set of demands that your building wants to win in the immediate short term. You're not gonna be on your own. You have us here to help and we'll be sending out some resources to all the participants on this call that recaps some of the tactics we talked about. And we can even try to connect you to uh, organizations in your city. Two, make a commitment. Commit to taking a radical uh, action on May 1st, the next time the rent is due. Once you've begun organizing, you'll have a better sense of who's on your team and what you need. Then we'll start talking about tactics to get everything that we need and that we deserve. Put your name in the chat right now if you are down to take action with us on May 1st. Let's see some names flooding in. Can't wait. Number three, keep showing up. We're going to do another call same time next week. Um, so show up and bring other people from your building. We're going to be digging one level deeper and we'll continue to support you in planning for the next steps. Ooh, the names are flooding in. That's great. Yeah, I see lots of names in the chat. Thank you so much, Divya. Um, and we're at the top of the hour. Thank you so much to all of our speakers and everyone who attended this call. And uh, I know a lot of folks were asking in the chat, you will receive an email from us tomorrow morning with follow-up. Um, and you can also find us on Twitter at hashtag rent zero or hashtag homes guarantee or at homesguarantee.com. And we'll see you back for another field call same time next week. Um, everyone stay safe and take care. 
And for folks who have some additional questions, uh, the folks who are experienced tenant organizers are, uh, have agreed to stay on the line for another 30 minutes or so to try and field some questions. Everyone else have a great night. Thanks everyone, good night. But stick around if you have questions. Should I stick around? <laughs> yeah, you're an expert, Barbara. Are you kidding me? I just need some mac and cheese, so I'm kind of hungry. <laughs> oh, go get go get it. That's why I was cutting it and I was like making it ugly all snap. Hold up. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Well, it was nice talking to you. I hope to stay connected. Love you. Peace. Solidarity. I'm a I'm a hang tight. Peace out. Bye. Bye. Uh, bye. How do you want to do this, team? We can field ones that are we know are in the chat already or Q and A's. There's still 73 people on. Yeah, I was gonna shout out a couple that I had seen before, even though we don't know um, if the folks are still here. There was one about how to organize people if they don't live in a traditional apartment building. So say folks are renting single family properties. And I thought Maurice and John, you'd both be good to answer that. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it's certainly, um, it's always a challenge in organizing when folks aren't close together. Um, if you've ever done any door knocking for anything, whether it be electoral or any campaign, you know that it's always tougher when people are further apart. Um, if you have a, a, if you live in a property where there are uh, things far apart, I saw someone said that they live in Arizona and they know that their landlord owns lots of things all around the state. They're likely just, they're likely not a mom and pop person. They're probably some type of corporation. And there's research that can get you what the rest of the addresses are, but more importantly, some more information about the company so that you can figure out your other points of leverage. Everything that we were talking about here is building power so that you have leverage to actually use it against your landlord to win what you need. So that, that, does often look like getting with a bunch of your neighbors who live in the same building as you um, and doing collective action together. And sometimes it looks like uh, getting research that really can hold your, your landlord accountable in a different way. I don't know, John, if you'd add anything else. Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, you can also look at county property records. I think it's always difficult to do that. Um, and so, you know, what we really try to do is to see like, Google your landlord, Google the company that um, you send your checks to, um, and then look at other places. Sometimes they use signs, sometimes they don't. Um, but yeah, looking them up, looking up county property records about the LLC or the landlord can often be helpful um, because I know Buffalo is mostly you know mom and pop duplexes. Um, and then once you're able to do that, you know, leaving flyers at the doors, normally would say knock on them, uh, but you can try to go and, and usually if you can find one or two other folks, then those folks can kind of help you with the research process to like find the rest. There's a question from Lauren from before that got missed, which is around, um, can folks organizing their building get evicted for doing so? I'm located in Seattle, Washington. If I know I can't really be evicted for organizing, I'll feel less careful about engaging with the process. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, I think yeah. We can't really hear you. Uh, sorry, we can't hear you. Yeah. Or Ryan, rather. I, so um, so I, I know that Seattle, uh, maybe years ago now, had passed a just cause eviction um, ordinance, which, which uh, essentially means that you, um, unless you, uh, have a just cause so that is defined um, in different different ways in different places but usually like you've done some horrible damage to the property or you refuse to pay rent for some other reason um, that's not because of like their lack of repairs or something um, that they can't evict you they can't evict you on a whim um, so in lots of cities, if that's not a policy that your city has it's a really important one to fight for um, because that stops a lot of um, certainly racially motivated evictions uh, and lots of other bad things that, that could happen. 
Um, there is sort of another part of it, which is that, um, you know, if you, with, if you, even if you have sort of on the books the right to uh, a just cause eviction, it's still really important to build the power in the way that John was describing because, um, you know, right in your current state, uh, you're in a power dynamic where the, the landlord thinks that they have lots of power over you and they can uh, manipulate all sorts of things to try and evict you. Um, so I would still do the same stuff that John was talking about of, you know, talking to your neighbors, um, you know, building those relationships, moving at the speed of trust, um, just so that you can um, protect yourself, both with the power that you've built and the law that's on the books. I don't know, John, if you'd add anything, or Tara. Um, yeah, I would just say, yeah, organizing is always, no matter what the laws say, the laws are never applied according to, they're applied according to power. And so I would really check in with folks in Seattle about what their housing court is like. And I'm sure there's like a legal community and there's some folks you can reach out to about getting more of a legal analysis. And I know there's a few tenant unions out there that could probably help give you a little more context because everything Maurice said is absolutely right. But different cities operate very differently. Uh, different housing court judges operate very differently in how they handle these situations. And that's like an unfortunate part about like passing a law is that you don't know exactly how it's gonna be executed or adjudicated. So I definitely think like reach out to uh there's a lot of active folks in seattle i think there's a there was someone in the chat who listed their contact information but obviously do everything that that we've already talked about but make sure you understand the context uh, that's why it's difficult to do these kind of trainings this way because everything is about the context you're in and the people you're around um there was a really good question a that was about tools for getting oneself organized before we go organize other people. Um, someone had asked, like literally, I think it was Scott had asked, um, what do you use? Like Google Sheets? Do you write it all down in your notebook? I feel like all of us could answer. Maybe Linda, do you want to give it a first stab? We can't hear you, hon. Still on mute. Okay. Oh, I got you. We can hear okay. you. Great. Yeah, I um, <coughs> actually started to talk to Jane Adams Senior Caucus at first because we got connected to uh, them through our one of our elected officials. And I went online and looked up everything about the, the owner who was about to sell us. And we figured that we would be sold to um, public housing and also did a great deal of research, talked to some people I knew who, who lived in public housing already, found out about how they were, you know, how they were treated, what their management was, uh, did they, did they um, have any problems? How did they solve the problems with the, the management companies or CHA? Um, how did they deal with members of uh, of the, like the CHA staff that were supposed to deal with with residents. It took a lot of research, a lot of work, and a lot of kind of organizing notes and figuring out how do I how do I do this? How am I going to get this done? And also, of course, convince my neighbors that it could be done. So I, I really had to do, oh, days and days and days and hours of research and find out from people I knew, from a couple of elected officials that even helped me and, and just friends who knew friends who knew friends who were connected to um, public housing in particular. It's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone else want to speak to tools like what literal tools do you use to get yourself organized before organizing your building? I, um, yeah, I, um, it's as far as tools, you mean like phone, phone computer? Um, yeah, phones, computers, and any like specific apps or anything that you use? Uh, no, I just, I just went through, you know, made myself a list of what I wanted to know and just went through, put everything in, um, Googled, so to speak, and found out you know, that way and, you know, called friends and talked to people. We had coffee, we had dinner, whatever. Yeah. yeah. 
How about others, Maurice, John, Ryan? So I, I, I don't do direct tenant organizing anymore, but when I did, I was, I was old school until the very, very, very end. So I, um, uh, even when I did some organizing in a building that I lived in once, I would have a sheet of butcher paper that had different lines on it for every single person that I, yeah, you can see it in Tara's background, for every single person that I met, it had their contact information on it. I would update it with the last thing, with a post-it note with the last thing that we talked about. Um, it had their email address on it. And then I used a numbering system for just like kind of how down they were to do some of the organizing. So, um, you know, ranking folks from like one, two, three, and four um with like you know one number meaning like they're ready to they're ready to go they're like as fired up as i am if i'm like let's go do an action on our landlord like they're going to be the first person they'll probably be ahead of me um and for for like the you know these people basically have told you don't talk to me ever again um and as the as a good organizer you're like maybe i'll talk to them in the future so i'll keep their contact information up there but if i need to do the action i'm not going to call them first so that was the system i used John, you want to jump in? Yeah. Um, so I definitely use like in my phone whenever I meet a tenant, you know, I'll put their name tenant and I'll usually put like down or like TT for like, I need to talk to them later. And then I will try to transfer that to like my wall. It doesn't always happen, but then there'll be just times where I'm just like going through my phone and I just search tenant. I'm like, Oh, I haven't texted this person. I haven't talked to this person in a while. Uh, so I think it's like important for me. Like I do all, everything through my phone to just find ways to identify people's numbers to make sure that like I start to notice them uh, and it can remind myself of when I haven't talked to someone in a while. And I would just add, I think like these guys, are all my heroes, all of you. Um, and they've been doing this longer than I have, quite frankly. Um, but we at KC Tenants are like pretty digital. <laughs> like we miss the era of doing this stuff on butcher paper. This is just for personal purposes. Um, we do everything in Google Sheets. So um, that's just a really easy way. It's not a paid platform, it's all free. So our leaders are like in the Google Sheets with us filling it all out um, takes a little bit of orientation, especially because we want to make sure that everything we do is inclusive of everyone, regardless of their ability to access technology or internet or regardless of their age. Um, but yeah, we use Google Sheets a lot. And uh, we also have like other fun apps and stuff that have been really helpful in our organizing. For example, we have like a texting app called Hustle that we use every once in a while when we need to spend like send a ton of texts at once costs a little bit of money, but if you do some basic fundraising, it's a really good way of reaching like 9,000 people in your city in one fell swoop. Um, let's see. Ooh, this is a good one. Robert says, what about really big property management companies that manage and own really big swaths of our community's housing stock, especially if this management company is managing for a lot of different landlords, both in state and out of state, are there any special considerations to take into account? Mo, you got this. There, there are indeed some special considerations to take into account. Um, so that's a great question. And, um, you know, one of the things about how our system is set up is that we're seeing more and more and more of these. So big companies that used to have absolutely nothing to do with housing in the past are getting into housing and scooping up either owning or managing lots of different properties um, to try and get as much money as possible. Um, this is an area where, I mean, all of the same things apply uh, in your individual building um, that uh, John and Linda and folks had talked about before. You should still do all of that personal organizing. You can't skip that step at all. Um, but uh, there's also an added research step that could make your fight so much more powerful throughout your state or potentially the country, depending on what the company is. Um, so there are actually a number of organizations that help uh, to do that research. One is the organization that I run actually called the Action Center on Race and the Economy. So we have a housing researcher that one of their roles is to help folks um, do exactly that. So to look into companies that uh, might be huge companies that are trying to destroy housing for uh, poor people, black people, brown people all around the, all around the country. So I'm gonna drop my uh, email address in the chat and I, um, Happy to follow up with you. Um, and uh, if we can't help, I can find someone who can for sure. 
Yeah, there are lots of cool, good lot. tools online too. Oh, sorry, go ahead, John. Yeah, I just wanna say there's a lot of opportunities for building cross-tenant solidarity. And so like do what you can where you're at and then we can all help you connect with folks in other places who are doing the same. And that's ultimately the purpose is that as the housing market organizes itself against us, we have to do the same and mirror that practice. Mm, totally. I was just gonna add, um, there are lots of tools online they're usually not as accessible as we wish they would be, but like in Kansas City, we have like a parcel viewer that like our city's planning department puts out. And when we look at that parcel viewer, we can search by address. And that's a way of like backing ourselves into figuring out who owns the property. Cause often like our tenants have no idea who their actual property owner is cause they only relate to the management company. So Google around for resources like that, wherever you live. The other thing that I will say is like, it's so, to the point that Maurice and John were making, so powerful to organize across properties um, that are owned by the same landlord. We had great success with this in Kansas City in the fall. We were organizing against this slumlord called TEH Realty, out of, actually an out of country corporation that uses like a private equity model and it's some of the worst housing in the city. And we started creating a lot of media about them and then there was a lot of media about them in St. Louis. And now we basically have like exploded their business. Like they're being run out of town. Even like our Republican senators are like calling them out right, right and left, writing bills about them. They're totally shamed throughout the city um, and the state. And that's because we started like exposing them and then other tenants figured out what we were doing and started organizing as well. I wanna make a quick point. Someone in the chat somewhere talked about affordable housing. Um, affordable housing is also a hustle and a racket and there's great affordable housing folks and then there's folks that just want developer fees and state money. One of the reasons I no longer work at Porch Buffalo is because of the tenant organizing I did in my own organization. Um, so they are not absolved of any of this and in fact you do have more leverage against them because of the state's funds that they receive and because of the way that their image is what actually drives how they're able to allocate or uh, get the resources. Um, so if anybody has any questions about that my email is also in the chat and we'd love to talk about organizing affordable housing because those are great opportunities to build social housing and for tenants to take over buildings. I saw another one from the chat that I want to uh, address is uh, first off underline that about affordable housing for sure because that is 100% true um, and then the there was one in the chat about what about smaller but still shady LLCs I'm in a small city without as much giant conglomerate landlords a couple of things there. First, and I'll keep saying this, the same rules apply no matter who owns the building. So you're going to start with relational organizing, start with talking to your neighbors, find crazy Bob or whatever John's person's name was, <laughs> like find that person and start, start with them. The same rules apply. Two, sometimes these LLCs are actually in the end owned by really, really big companies. So it's another opportunity um, to potentially do some uh, cross building, cross city, cross state, whatever, um, organizing. Um, and then lastly, three, there's information that you might be able to get from, uh, from, your lo from your state or locality about who actually owns the LLC. Sometimes you'll, you know, your, your check goes to or the property management company is just 123 Main Street LLC. If your city can tell you that actually, like, John Doe owns the property, then you can actually, you have more leverage then. You then have someone that you can do an action on. You know exactly who you're organizing against and it's not a faceless corporation. So those are the tips I'd have there. Yeah, I would just say follow the money. So wherever folks are sending their rent, uh, is definitely where to start. Like they, folks might have multiple LLCs, multiple vehicles, but who, who cashes that check? Right. Um, that's where you start. And yeah, it takes some research, it takes some Googling, um, but there's a lot of information out there online. And then even if they are bigger, like you can still start with the small bill. Like if it's a duplex and they own 40 duplexes, you can still have those two people, you know, that live in that duplex, um, you know, go on rent strikes or, or do that power building. Um, so just because they're big doesn't mean you can't take it step by step. And if you find out they're big, focus on what you know, do what you can where you know, and then use that to grow. Um, I have a question that I want to pose to Linda. Uh, because senior, like organizing seniors is kind of a different challenge, right? You sort of alluded to this before, um, kind of jokingly when you said like, we left the organizing behind us in the 60s and 70s, right? But like, tell us a little bit about the challenges that you've experienced organizing 
with people in your age group, other elders, and what are also like the opportunities and the power that's been possible because you've organized seniors? Okay, sure. <clears throat> uh, yeah, some of the challenges are there's, there's a, especially if, say in my building, uh, we had been through this crisis once and there was a lot of fear behind, oh, you know, can we, can we actually organize? Can, can we fight back like with CHA? Can we fight back about some of the conditions in our building or will we get, will we get retaliated against? Will we be evicted? Because CHA is known for retaliation in Chicago and they are very, they can be very, very, very nasty and ugly <laughs> and seniors are going to be afraid to do that. And you know, what, what has worked for me in my building is just, this sounds rather obvious, but calming people down and saying, look, you know, we fought for, we fought for this. We have our homes. We can um, overcome, so to speak. And we have done that through Jane Addams Senior Caucus. There have been big, um, actions against CHA, for instance, their, their elevator had not been inspected for decades. And we found out about it and we did a die-in and by golly, they, they have started to come through this elevator. And yeah, you know, it, it just happens like, like that, but yes, Trying to organize seniors is very difficult. Some people do not want to be involved and you just have to let them go because you can only take so much of your own energy. I just want to shout out, um, so I used to live in Chicago and organize more closely with Linda. Um, and that action that she just described, the die-in, was one of the moments that I realized just how powerful seniors can be when they take action together. I was the police liaison for that action, meaning I was trying to fend the police off and like lie to them and, you know, a little brown girl, I would never break the rules, like telling them we just needed five more minutes, five more minutes, five more minutes. And the thing that became clear to me was that the police were so concerned about what the photo op would look like yes. if they picked seniors up off the floor and drag them out of the CHA. So the seniors ended up occupying the CHA lobby for over an hour and then winning everything that they demanded that day. It was just so, so, so dope. Okay, we got a couple other questions here. Um, what types of state and local laws can tenant unions or groups of organized tenants typically lean on for legal protection? Mm. I mean, just cause as, as you know, Maurice talked about earlier, but I think this is also a good question because it's also like, what do tenant unions need to be working on to create better conditions for organizing and to leverage their power at that level? And it really depends on where you're at. Some states have decent laws. No, no state really has what we really need, uh, which is the homes guarantee. Um, so it kind of depends state to state, but I would say, you know, just, just a good cause legislation uh, obviously is helpful, but no matter what's on paper, it's still about power. Yeah, it's, it, it might sound like we're just like trashing legal defense and laws. And um, and it, I mean, if it sounds like that for me, it's just because I've, I've worked with just dozens and dozens of people um, around housing, both rental and uh, uh, home ownership, where the law was 100% on their side and it was clear as you could read it in the newspaper. <laughs> and they still lost their home. They still lost their place to live. Um, so entirely relying on, on the legal backing um, is, I, I just would never recommend it. I, it's always important to um, build the power like John is saying. I also want to say like there are opportunities like we need tenant unions and tenant organizing does need legal support. Um, so every community does have some sort of legal aid or <clears throat> something similar. And it's really important to actually organize those folks and not just say, hey, 
come give me this explicit and specific type of support, but to actually build relationships. So I believe like everything is organizing. And if you're going to get to the point where you want to do work on state local legislation, you're going to need coalition. And those folks are incredibly important. So I can't highlight enough how important it is to build relationships on every level um, because even then a lot of those legal aid folks will represent your tenants differently and the folks that you work with differently because of the relationships you build with them um, because most of those groups are incredibly overwhelmed so again build relationships lawyers are important but you still need power okay let's take one more question just because it's a really exciting one and then we'll wind things down Virginia, who I think is in LA, asked the question, I'm not sure what the legal basis would be, but could tenant unions sue their city for a rent moratorium or any kind of other demands? Are any unions or citizen lobbies taking these steps? I wanted to take a first stab at this and then others can jump in on the question about suing specifically. One other thing that's really exciting about building tenant power, and Linda spoke to this a little bit on the panel, is that you can start with your building and start with demands about your building, the conditions, the rent, whatever it is. But if you build enough power, you can start to make demands at the city level and across cities and at the state level. And then obviously all of us know each other through a national level campaign. And so that's part of why it's so important actually to start that like door by door power building. And there are a lot of state and local, um, sorry, there are a lot of tenant unions, tenant organizations, and other community groups right now who are working on winning some of the policies um, through the government that we need as immediate relief in this moment. So my first answer to you, Virginia, is like, I think tenant union organizing can be a really powerful um, uh, kind of base of power to leverage for a local organization to help them win some of that more like systems change stuff. Does anyone else want to dig in on how to win a rent moratorium? I think everything you said is exactly on point. Cool. Okay, let's see if there's any last burning questions. Okay, no, and people have to jump. So let's wind down. Um, and I think my last ask is for everyone who's still here, there are like 50 of you who hung out for Homes Guarantee after hours. I wanna ask, will each of you commit to bringing one friend to next Thursday's conversation? And if you're in, put your name in the chat. Great. Awesome. And if it's more than one, that's cool too. Cool. Sweet. All right. Great. This is up. amazing. Cool. All so, right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. The recording and the follow-up email will be out tomorrow morning. And we'll see you all next Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Lots of people. Yeah. Lots of so y'all, um, let me send a really quick um, uh, debrief line. And okay. Linda and John, if you want to just hop on for like five minutes, let's connect okay. about next steps with Lee, um, who's going to join us there. Okay. Okay.